afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Game Center. Uh, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We apologize for starting a little late. We were having some technical difficulties, and uh, we will have our ASL interpreters on as soon as we can. Uh, but, uh, but until then, we, we're going to go ahead and begin housekeeping and introductions. Uh, welcome to today's webinar from Silos to Collaboration, Linking Healthcare, Public Safety, and Behavioral Health. Next slide, please. I am Dr. Melissa Stein, and I, I am a Senior Research Associate at Policy Research Associates, and I will be your moderator for today. And just a, a few housekeeping slides. Uh, this webinar is uh, sponsored or uh, brought to you by uh, the SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And so uh, the views, opinions, and content expressed in the presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Throughout the uh, presentations today, we welcome your questions. You should see on the uh, lower right-hand side of your screen, there's a Q&A pod. You can expand that and enter a question in at, at any time. And at the conclusion of the presentations, we will address as many questions as possible. This is also a place where you can enter questions in regards to technology, and our uh, staff will respond with some support. We'll also be conduct conducting a couple of polls and appreciate your participation. When you see a poll pop up on your screen, just uh, enter and uh, submit your response. And thank you for your participation. The webinar is being recorded and we will be disseminating slides in the days following this webinar. We'll also notify you when the webinar recording is posted to SAMHSA's YouTube channel. And at the conclusion of our event today, a certificate of attendance will be available for download. However, please note this is for, for your personal portfolio. We are not able to issue CEU credits. So as I mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, we have arranged for ASL interpretations um, during this meeting. And um, we really appreciate our two interpreters for today's event, Michelle Johnson and Maureen Moose. And uh, we will be bringing them on camera as soon as possible. And once they are on camera for best visibility, we recommend um, changing the layout of the WebEx on your screen. And so how to best do that is to go to the upper right-hand corner of the window. There's a tab that says Layout. Click on that. Select Side-by-Side -side for best visibility of the interpreters. Uh, there's also live captioning of today's webinars to enhance accessibility. To view live captioning, select the Accept or Continue button in the Multimedia Pod, which is located in the lower right-hand corner of the WebEx screen. And um, we do recommend selecting high contrast as the color contrast for best visibility. So just a quick look at our, um, our agenda today. So today we are talking about um, going, moving from silos to collaboration, linking healthcare, public safety, and behavioral health. And as you'll see, our speakers represent all of those uh, different aspects of this work, healthcare, public safety, and behavioral health. And in a, a few slides later, I'll introduce all of our presenters. But first, I'd like to turn things over to John Berg. He is a senior public health advisor for the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA, and he has some opening remarks. John. Thank you, Dr. Stein. Welcome, everyone, to today's webinar from Silos to Collaboration, Linking Healthcare, Public Safety, and Behavioral Health, Part 1 in a two-part series. We appreciate you taking time today to participate in this informative webinar. SAMHSA is very pleased to provide a webinar on the importance of building community partnerships with criminal justice and behavioral health agencies. Treatment providers and criminal justice professionals tend to operate in silos, despite the fact that they often serve the same populations with behavioral health disorders. 
while over half of people in jail and prison have a substance use disorder, individuals who are identified to need treatment and recovery supports are frequently unable to access those services when booked into or released from the jail. This is often due to limited partnerships between criminal justice and behavioral health agencies, resulting in few opportunities to start or continue treatment. There is a critical need for cross-disciplinary collaboration to enable a recovery-oriented approach to support individuals with mental and substance use disorders who may be cycling in and out of local jails and hospital emergency departments. Today, we are focusing on San Diego's Serial Enabia Program, or SIP, exploring ways to build and support collaborations between key stakeholders to improve outcomes for those familiar faces in our criminal justice and behavioral health systems who experience mental and substance use disorders. Essential aspects of engaging partners and cultivating buy-in will be presented, including practical considerations for building collaboration in both correctional and community-based settings. We are very pleased today to have three great presenters, uh, Dr. James Dunford, John Leaning, and Danette McClagan. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise today. I would also like to thank the Gaines Center and their staff for their work in developing and facilitating today's webinar. At this time, I'll turn it back to Dr. Stein. John. And now I would like to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, Dr. Dr. Jim Dunford is Professor Emeritus of Emergency Medicine at the University of California, San Diego. And he's the Medical Director of McAllister Institute, where he oversees the Regional Sobering Center and the care of patients living with substance use disorders. And he has taught and practiced emergency medicine since 1980 and served as the City of San Diego, California's EMS Director for 20 years. He co-founded the Serial Inebriate Program with the San Diego Police Department and uh, also created the San Diego Information Exchange with 211 San Diego. John Leaning, uh, Officer John Leaning is a retired officer with the San Diego, California Police Department where he worked for over 23 years in patrol as a field training officer and a psychiatric emergency response team officer. And he co-founded the serial inebriate program with Dr. Dunford and served as the SIP liaison officer for the San Diego Police Department's homeless outreach team. And he has assisted numerous communities with developing their own SIP programs and has conducted numerous trainings across the country with police departments. He's currently an investigator for the Office of the City Attorney of San Diego Neighborhood Justice and Collaborative Courts Unit. And Danette, or Danny McLagan, is Operations Director at McAllister Institute, where she develops population-specific treatment strategies. And she is a creator of treatment strategies for the SIP program, and also a curriculum development developer for people with alcohol use disorders who are experiencing chronic homelessness. And she has served on the San Diego Committee for the Plan to End Chronic Homelessness and is the previous head of services for mental health systems correction division, where she oversaw post-release treatment programs for the California Department of Corrections. And she is a certified alcohol and drug counselor. So that's who is presenting today, but I also want to look at who's joining us today and who's participating in this webinar. I see that a majority of you are calling in from urban locations with, with about the same number of you joining from rural and suburban locations. In terms of uh, the kinds of organizations you're calling from, we're seeing the largest number of you calling in from government. However, we're also seeing some folks calling in from public health, community-based service providers, the judiciary, and law enforcement. So thanks so much uh, to all of you for being with us today and uh, joining us for these presentations. For now, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim Dunford to get us started. Jim? And Dr. Gumford, I want to make sure you're not muted. Hi, can everyone hear me? Hi, this is again, Dr. Jim Dunford, and thank you for inviting us today. Uh, welcome from San Diego, California. 
Uh, we are a population of 1.4 million, the eighth largest city in the US and the seat of our county government. Uh, we are 372 square miles, 42 miles of shoreline. We are full of sun, but we do have our problems. And the fact is that we are the fourth largest population of uh, people experiencing homelessness in the country. Um, today, I'm going to be discussing uh, our experience here in San Diego with developing some novel partnerships between uh, our law enforcement community and our uh, health providers and behavioral health. These are issues that are vexing problems that require partnerships that we uh, recognize uh, can only be solved through collaboration. And therefore, we want to recognize right off the top the programs we're about to talk about are directly the result of a commitment between the city of San Diego and the county of San Diego of their leadership to be able to make these programs possible. The goal of our first session will be, as described here, are to describe the costly, first of all, and in inferior outcomes that unfortunately result uh, when we try to use a fragmented approach to deal with people who have complex chronic medical and psychosocial issues. Um, we're gonna try to articulate our experience and why partnerships between law enforcement and behavioral health and healthcare make so much sense and then we're going to use an example, the San Diego Serial Inebriate Program, uh, which was created to address the challenge of chronic uh, public intoxication. Um, in our second workshop, in our second workshop, which will be scheduled on May 18th, we'll discuss how this SIP template can be used to address other complex interdisciplinary community problems including problems such as the expanding challenges of the methamphetamine and opioid epidemic. Um, we're also gonna be joined at that time by officers from the Billings, Montana Police Department, who are gonna talk about how they used our SIP model to fit uh, their community's needs. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Just thinking for a moment, uh, you know, from 50,000 feet, um, I think Maybe this is not news to anybody, but it is worth remembering that a small fraction of individuals generate the vast uh, uh, component of healthcare expenses in the United States. Uh, this was a study in 2016 that was done by the Kaiser Family Foundation, which produced this analysis of the contribution of groups of healthcare spenders to the overall healthcare expenditure of the country. And shockingly, to the far left, you can see that. The top 1% of spenders generate 22% of all the healthcare costs in this country. And the top 5% of spenders generate 50% of the healthcare spending. For the most part, these people are Medi Medi dual eligibles. In other words, they qualify for Medicaid and Medicare by virtue of having multiple chronic healthcare and psychosocial issues typically confounded by low income. And they often times receive very fragmented and inconsistent care with entirely suboptimal outcomes. So this enormous amount of money we're devoting to a small population of individuals. The second slide brings it a little bit closer, or the next slide please, brings it a little closer to home. Um, this, is, this issue is not a new one. Uh, in 1996 to 1997, uh, I was asked to analyze the cost of 15 individuals here in San Diego who had been transported to emergency departments repeatedly. And I was at, at that time, I was the medical director of the fire department in San Diego. Two new police officers that were assigned to a community policing storefront in the downtown area approached me and wanted to demonstrate to the rest of the community uh, what they knew to be true, which was that there was this enormous consumption of resources by a small group of people. I was able to approach uh, two large hospitals in the region and I asked simply for what was the bill to take care of these 15 men uh, and I got the ambulance charges. The result of the bill, as you can see, was about a million and a half dollars over this period of time. And that report went to our police chief, it went to the mayor, and that was very key in this basic first analysis of the expenses to the community in the implementation of what we now uh, call the Homeless Outreach Team, which is a team uh, that is operated by the San Diego Police Department. And at that moment, that was the first real insight as an emergency physician for me as the importance of law enforcement 
in de designing any kind of plan that was going to actually be able to deal with recidivist uh, people who were uh, frequently brought to my emergency department uh, in times that I would see them multiple times in a weekend. Next slide. Now, this story has been amplified in many in many ways, and if, for those of you that are familiar uh, with Malcolm Gladwell, the famous writer, in, two, in February of 2006, he wrote an article that was called Million Dollar Murray, and this really galvanized, I think, the nation for the first time that how impactful uh, this could be in a community. This particular man uh, at the time, Murray, had generated over a million dollars in charges living on the streets of Reno, Nevada, and never really was benefited and died on the street. These individuals, again, high utilizers, highly impactful. They have complex behavioral, physical, and social needs. They repeatedly are accessing a range of services, and they amass a tremendous number of contacts with public safety, emergency departments, behavioral health, and other stakeholders. And the, the worst part is despite the vast amount of money, they almost never get any benefit from, from all that's been saved, or spent, excuse me. Um, to address this issue, I mentioned already the homeless outreach team, which was created, believe it or not, by the police department here in 1999. The hot team, which exists to this day, is an example of the police department's early uh, uh, efforts in this direction, to, which was known as, uh, still to, is known as community-oriented policing services. And what these are, are uh, a philosophy among police departments that promote strategies to use proactive problem solving and to reach out to communities in terms of being able to uh, proactively address conditions that are giving rise to public safety issues. <clears throat> Now, uh, our hot team really in the beginning, and the members of it are right there, and I'm about to explain, include a law enforcement officer, a health and human services agency, a uh, case representative, and a, an individual we refer to as a perp clinician. That is a behavioral health expert. <clears throat> From the very beginning, it was obvious that mental health issues and the police department uh, overlapped enormously. And the idea of bringing aboard on select units a behaviorally health trained individual was begun really in the late 90s in San Diego. <clears throat> in addition to these licensed workers, the police foundation who originally, these, these folks just kind of came aboard on a voluntary basis, the San Diego Fire or Police Foundation, excuse me, funded the first two positions of these clinicians that were riding with specially trained officers, including Officer Leaning, who you'll hear from in a minute. Um, this was so successful that uh, the word went quickly across the community. And before you knew it, the fire department wanted to be a part of the deal as well. And so oftentimes, and I'll discuss a little bit more later, uh, we have assigned community paramedics to fill even a fourth position on the homeless outreach team. Next slide, please. Her in San Diego County is a very important component of law enforcement. These are licensed mental health clinicians who are paired with trained officers and medics. You can see the kind of contacts, the numbers of contacts in our region. Uh, in 2019-20, over 35,700 contacts, 12,000 crisis interventions, and 5,750 uh, interventions that actually diverted uh, individuals away from transports involuntarily to emergency departments and then multiple other community service interventions. Uh, in addition, our per team is very important because they provide training to all aspects of law enforcement in San Diego County relevant to behavioral health crises and de-escalation techniques. Even the 911 uh, dispatchers attend the PERT Academy. And this is a direct reflection of the collaboration between public safety and behavioral health in our community. Um, now, this was really uh, in response to planning and actually uh, listening sessions with the community about the importance of doing this type of cross training. John. Yeah, let me jump in here. Um, this is John Lee. Back in the 1990s, this was a big change for law enforcement. We actually had a clinician riding in the vehicle with a police officer going out to address calls that involve mental health issues. And as easy as that sounds, there is a different language that mental health professionals speak than law enforcement speak. So 
that just happening. Uh, we we kind of grease over it today, but that was a big change for law enforcement. That was really about community policing and getting involved and addressing issues in a collaborative way. We had actually experienced in, uh, in the early 1990s several officer involved shootings uh, and critical incidents that involved people living with uh, mental illness. And it was apparent at that time that there was a gap between law enforcement and mental health providers. And that really, uh, uh, you know, uh, incited uh, interest, enthusiasm, and continued uh, expansion of investment of per clinicians by our board of supervisors assigning these to law enforcement agencies in proportion to the number of mental health calls throughout the region. The tragic part is that not only are these people expensive and impact uh, our public safety assets, but the individuals themselves are really at great personal risk. Um, back in January of 2011, uh, the police department and San Diego Fire were asked to identify the city's most impactful individuals. At that time, the United Way of San Diego wanted to uh, develop a housing first initiative to show the implications of housing people and providing wraparound services. And the way that those individuals were identified was contacts with EMS and police, as well as behavioral health counts. We were uh, I, able to identify 71 people that really needed the services because of their impacts on the community. And by the time we could reach those people to offer them the opportunity for two years of, or actually essentially permanent supportive housing, nine of them had died. So the, uh, that figure should not be lost is that these people are at an inordinately high risk of death in addition to the consumption of the resources. So let's move ahead. I think everybody has seen this picture who's involved in it one way or another. It might look like a traffic accident victim in the upper left corner, but the fact is that this is a, a gentleman who's living with alcohol uh, use disorder and who once again has tripped and fallen and has now got a law enforcement officer, a paramedic, and a bunch of firefighters. Um, and what I would see in the emergency department, literally, if I worked a three shift weekend, I would see the same individual three times. And each time the individual would, would go through what's being depicted in that right lower corner. After a period of sobering on a gurney and taking up a bed, there was a perfunctory walk to the bathroom to see if he could ambulate well enough that he would actually be able to be discharged uh, with hopes that he'd follow up and it never happened. Uh, there was a disconnect and once again, he'd be back in the system. Next. Um, John Leaning jumping in again. Also, if you go back to any one picture. Go back one picture. If you look at the picture on the left, this is a typical call, and we see this in big cities across the nation, is a business owner will call and say, there's a subject passed out in front of my business. The officers will arrive. They will know that individual. They have seen him numerous times. They know him personally. Uh, the paramedics and fire department will arrive. They know that individual. We all know Bob on the street and we all are trained to help Bob. So this is something, again, we don't just own in San Diego. We hear this from every major city in the nation. And, and as John so well articulated, this is affecting the population of uh, 911 responding vehicles, bringing somebody uh, or responding to an emergency consuming that resource that was a finite, uh, you know, only finite number of ambulances, bringing them to the hospital and having them revolve around and around. And in San Diego, one of the places where people could be brought uh, is the sobering center, which I'll talk about more because it figures significantly in the serial inebriate program. Not all communities have sobering centers, but San Diego has had one. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a couple pictures of it in a minute, but since the mid 80s, we've had an alternative to incarceration, uh, detention and jail, and that's the sobering center. But the fact is that the sobering center out to the hospital and around and around uh, became the issue for essentially everybody in San Diego. Next slide. And so here is that uh, entire community, and I think We've got representation on, I can see today in terms of who's participating. I think somebody should be able to find who who they are in this uh, image. But right in the middle of all that, I saw 
the emergency department. And uh, as the medical director of the city, I saw the intercept of all those uh, in a very kind of unique public health uh, way. Uh, because we have 1.3 million people and I could see all the ambulance transports in the community. And I thought if I wasn't going to do something about it, how, who else was going to help the police and all the other people that were uh, uh, affected by this problem? So what we're really getting at here is this thing that some people call collective impact, which is a term to bring the leadership of traditionally siloed entities together to develop a set a common mission and a set of metrics. And I would just highlight also that SAMHSA has over the last several years made some really wonderful uh, national workshops and efforts to train communities to address these sorts of dilemmas by promoting senior level involvement and in sharing data through law enforcement, fire, shelters, and housing to identify the exceptionally impactful, impactful individuals for targeted services. Okay, just a word or two about our sobering center because I think it's, it's very important. The city and county of San Diego have operated a sobering center jointly, funded it since 1984. It um, serves individuals who are contacted by law enforcement who are publicly uh, intoxicated and they're brought to the sobering center for a four hour stay. It diverts from jail and the emergency department. It provides a safe sobering environment and it uh, provides care for individuals with uncomplicated intoxication. Uh, sobering centers are hardly ubiquitous. Um, many communities still bring people to the emergency department or the jail, which only is exacerbating overcrowding issues in both of those settings. And in our second workshop, I'm going to talk briefly about a, a wonderful new collaborative called the National Sobering Collaborative, which is working to expand sobering centers across the country. We're going to discuss their work further and suffice it to say, these centers do fill key gaps in the continuum of care for substance use disorder and behavioral health. Here's a picture of our sobering center. Um, in contradistinction to some, 90% of the clients that are brought by law enforcement to our sobering center are what you would call revelers. Uh, there are people who simply are uh, unable to provide a safe environment for themselves. They're encountered by law enforcement. And uh, in order to uh, be accepted into our, uh, our center, you have to be ambulatory with minimal assistance and cooperative. They're traditionally younger men, often employed and usually not experiencing homelessness. It's a fairly simple place. Um, the front entrance, you can see uh, people are screened outside during COVID uh, to make sure they don't have any COVID-like symptoms. Um, it's a very quick process for law enforcement. On the right, you can see the police log. Um, they usually provide minimal uh, demographic information regarding the individual and are uh, usually out the door within 10 minutes if the staff and law enforcement agree that it's an appropriate placement for the person. Now, this is real key because the SIP, the SIP program relies on that list right there uh, and individuals who have come five times by law enforcement to our sobering center within 30 days are um, rejected. It's, it, the SIP program is predicated on the idea that if you've been brought five times in 30 days, the system is not working for you. That five number was actually defined by substance use providers in the community that said five was too many. Our staff includes uh, counselors, health navigators. We're very simple in the way we run things. Run things. We have mats on the floor that people uh, are asked to stay four hours voluntarily. This is not a locked facility. We have a wall between men and women, and we've had to make do during COVID in order to be able to keep it COVID free. But amazingly, we've been able to do so. Now we're back to focusing a little bit more on the high users. And they are very different than our traditional sobering center client. Uh, they constitute about 10% 10, 10 of the folks that are brought in. And th they're the target again of our serial inebriate program effort. On average, they've been experiencing homelessness for more than 10 years. They've had dozens, if not hundreds of transports and multiple prior failures in all of the traditional treatment programs in San Diego. They have been through all of them and none worked. And I'm going to turn it over to John now because uh, the San Diego Police Department is to be credited for the fact that they recognized we had to have a new approach. So the law enforcement's new approach um, 
was basically collaboration and partnership. So community policing. The San Diego Police Department has been a leader in community policing since the mid 1990s, working with the community to address complex issues with a compassionate approach. You heard earlier about the revolving door of in and out of jail and emergency rooms. We wanted a plan to stop or slow that revolving door, provide treatment and increase the quality of life for the community and that individual. We asked the community how this population uh, population had an impact on them. This is just a few of their responses. Um, as you can see, there were others um, like frequency of radio calls, out of service time, and really no hope or light at the end of the tunnel for this issue. So in California, it is against the law to be drunk in public. But the elements of drunken public are very specific and a high threshold. As you can see, you must be found in a public place under the influence of intoxicating liquor or drug, unable to exercise care for your safety or the safety of others, or interfering with the free use of street, sidewalk, sidewalk, or public rights. Um, not all states in have this uh, statute but most have some form of a disorderly behavior um, ordinance. The goal of SIP is to provide treatment and housing with wraparound services, reducing the emergency room and jail visits. This is one of our sober living um, housing complex. They all live together and they actually form their own community. So how did we get to the goal of treatment and housing? This was our strategy. Law enforcement will transport individuals who meet the elements of 647F to the sobering center. This provides the opportunity for that individual to meet with the trained staff who can provide the resources needed. Hopefully, they will take the resources offered, but sometimes they do not and the process starts all over again. Once they have reached that fifth visit in 30 day period, they are taken into custody and will appear in court. The city attorney will review the case and if they decide to issue it, the city attorney office will make the offer of treatment prior to court and during the entire process. The individual has the opportunity or the treatment resources at any time. To meet our goals and strategy, we decided uh, we developed great partnerships. But with those partnerships came an array of concerns. These are some of the concerns you see here. All valid, legitimate concerns, staffing, jail overcrowding, and medical costs. Uh, but we all agreed that we can move forward. We also agreed that the status quo um, was not was unacceptable. That all the partners' concerns were valid, and that we uh, start with a one-year pilot program. We would meet monthly and discuss any concerns, issues and maintain the open dialogue. The SIP model started in 2000 and is thriving today. Thanks to our partners and community, numerous individuals' lives have been impacted and changed forever. So hi, Denny McLagan, uh, Program Manager for Kiva Women and Children's Learning Center. Um, for 22 years, I was the Program Manager of the Serial and EBIT Program. I think one of the interesting things that we want to point out here is when we started this partnership, we had all of these people who were in that, that one slide that we showed you with all of those different bubbles connected. All those people came around the table and uh, we, we had some in, interesting commentary. You know, people were very concerned that they were going to be asked to do their job differently or that they might be excommunicated from their job and all of these kind of conversations. So we made sure, oh, there's so much echo. 
Okay, I'll talk quieter. Uh, we wanted to make sure um, that uh, everybody at the table at any time could back out of that the conversation. So the first thing that we did was at any time somebody could come in the room and say, you know what, we're not doing this anymore. We don't like the idea, and that was fine for you to say no. The other part of the deal was that we didn't ask anybody to do anything different than their job originally as defined. So the police were still going to enforce the law and arrest people for drunk and public laws. The city attorney was still going to prosecute those cases. The emergency room would still treat those people as they were brought in for um, their health issues. And for in my role, we felt like we were for the first time going to be asked to participate in the treatment of the client. So. Um, but it is important to note that at any time, any person could be uh, walk away from from the conversation, and surprisingly, no one did. So we actually started in just one uh, one district of the police department and took it really slow, right, John? Yeah, and I remember our first meetings. Every part, every person, every partner who came in, there were some walls that were up, and as we met monthly and we continued that dialogue, those walls started to come down, the relationship started to build, and we are actually moving forward. So one of the interesting things, and it was mentioned earlier, is the fact that, you know, when, when we travel across the United States and we're working with other communities to help them build serial and EBIT program type models of care, that one of the things that we always hear is, oh, well, we already have treatment in our city. We don't, we don't need to worry about treatment. We, we pretty much got that covered and my response to that is if you have treatment and it's working, why are we here? Um, and so uh, it's interesting when we started the program, we were like very much wanting people uh, to uh, come to treatment. We were like, just just show up, just, just come on in. And we were being really nice to them and begging them to stay. And we quickly found out was that we felt like maybe we were um, being taken advantage of a little bit, like some of our participants might have been there just because, well, this was my way to get out of custody. And so we, we, and then we started realizing that the same, the same shoe didn't fit every client. And so we started modeling our program to meet the needs of our client. And so one of the things that we found out very quickly was that People with substance use disorders and alcoholism will not enroll in programs that don't understand them. So typically that means that, you know, we will enroll a client into a treatment program. And if that client fills the program, then what the common statement is, oh, well, we have a resistant client. Our client is resistant to care. And so uh, we, we found out right away that there's no such thing as a single treatment program that's, that's appropriate for every person. Um, the other part of it that we learned was that we're not doing rehabilitation. Um, we do habilitation. As mentioned earlier, the average length of time, we found out that the average length of time for our participants early on was that they've been experiencing homelessness for over 16 years. And so they had lost a lot of their habilitative skills. Um, that meant that we were dealing with early on was not just treating the substance use disorder and the alcoholism, but that we were trying to institute habilitative skills, basic hygiene skills. We had a one client that came into the program for the first 30 days of treatment, and you saw that beautiful apartment building where they all stay. He wouldn't sleep indoors. Um, we got a call from the landlord and said, hey, you know, I don't know if you know this, but one of your guys is sleeping on the porch every night. And so he just wasn't comfortable sleeping inside. It took us 30 days to get him from the front porch to the living room, to the couch, to his own bed. So we're really talking about uh, working on habilitative skills for these this population. The other side of it is, uh, and you can read it here, recurrence rates for addiction resemble those of other chronic diseases. Too often we're treating substance use disorders and alcoholism, an, an acute model of care. So we bring somebody in, we prescribe them the aspirin for their cancer, and we're like, okay, here's your aspirin. We're gonna give you 30 days of, of care, even though you've been an alcoholic or have a substance use disorder for 20 years, but we're gonna give you 30 days of treatment, and then we'd like for you to be better and go away and don't come back. We also have the idea that if while you're in treatment, 
if there's some relapse, the response should be that we kick you out of treatment. And so that's why I referenced this here when we're talking about a chronic diseases. I couldn't imagine if I was diagnosed with cancer and uh, I went and they were like, well, this cancer thing is going to be really hard to treat and it's going to really disrupt your life. So what we'd like you to do is go to 10 cancer self-help support groups and please don't come back to the hospital. By the way, if your cancer goes away, we're going to check on you again next year. If your cancer comes back, we will kick you out of the hospital. We told you not to get cancer and don't come back. So what we've learned here is that for our population, engagement is an iterative process. And so that means that we're going to see people over and over and over again. And so we're reinforcing certain strategies. On top of that, the difference is that everybody knows what John referenced was Bob. So now the courts are engaged. So if Bob relapses or walks away from treatment, the courts see him, the police see him, the emergency department will see him, and Bob is redirected to care. So we're saying over and over and over again that there's a focused outcome for this, this client, this patient, and that the idea is that treatment will be the answer. We also know historically on the other side of the coin is that uh, drug, drug treatment reduces associative costs. So, and we'll talk more about the cost savings for the serial anemia program. The reality is that, you know, on national averages that um, cost savings for treatment can be almost $12, $12 for every dollar uh, spent. And so, if nothing else, it's, uh, as they like to say, cheaper to treat her, and uh, certainly it's more humane. Uh, there's also some concern about um, whether or not coerced care is an appropriate and effective form of, of treatment. And the reality is, is that most people will find treatment because somebody told them that they were done. Um, that can be a family member, an employer, and for us, obviously, the criminal justice system and that we're saying, you know what, we kind of love you just the way you are, but we love you too much to let you stay that way. And so the reality is that co coerced forms of treatment can be very effective. Um, the other side of it again is one, one size does not fit all. And so the treatment program has to be very specific to the population that you're serving. A good example of that is if you put our client into a standard treatment program. So you have somebody who is a chronic alcoholic. And you're placing them into your Joe's uh, drug treatment program, and we're going to put you in group. And in that group, you have a methamphetamine user, and that methamphetamine user is talking about the problems that he had with his employer. And next to him is the cocaine user, and he's talking about the problems that he had with his landlord. And next to him is a heroin user, and he's talking about the problems that he had with uh, his girlfriend. And you have somebody who has been experiencing homelessness for 15 years, who has no job, no girlfriend, and no place to live, and he can't participate in that conversation. So what treatment does in that regard is essentially disenfranchise um, your client from that conversation. So they leave treatment feeling worse than when they came in. So that can't work. So what we did was, we had a fellow come in very first day, and we've all seen those simple screening forms. Um, you've seen them in magazines and things. Ten questions to find out if you're an alcoholic. They ask questions like, um, have your friends or family expressed concern over your drinking? Um, do you find yourself drinking before you go to a party? Um, have you missed work recently due to your alcohol use? And so we, you know, those standard forms of care, we gave that screening form as we're required to do to a client and he answered all the questions and he came back and he's like, I have really good news. I don't even need to be here. I'm not an alcoholic. Answered no to all your questions. Obviously he did, he doesn't have a job. The people that he associates with would hope that he has alcohol. He, he, he's not missing work. He doesn't have a car. So we had to develop new screening tools for this population that were very specific. So when we screen someone, we're asking them questions such as, if you were to panhandle $5, would you use that $5 to buy food or alcohol? Have you had more than four hour period of voluntary sobriety? So those questions, by the way, the guy that handed us back the screening form saying he wasn't an alcoholic had been arrested 220 times that day for the offense of drunk in public. And so we can see that that 220 times, that's boiling a frog. So the idea is 
that if you, and I, hopefully a lot of you are familiar with this concept, the idea is that if you put a frog in a pot of boiling water, that frog will jump out right away. But if you put a frog in a pot of water and you turn up the heat until it boils, the frog will stay there until he dies. And so the concern for us in this population is that we're really dealing with people that are boiled frogs that have been in treatment multiple times in treatment programs that did not identify or, or um, support the model of care that they needed. And so ultimately our clients will not only be resistant to that treatment, but they will blame you for the reason that they're now experiencing homelessness or that their alcohol use has gotten worse. So they'll not only say that it wasn't helpful, but that it made things worse. So what we wanna do is that we make sure that we're not boiling frogs. And so that we're attaching people to the right type and level of care. More than that, having said all of that, our research showed that even with this coerced model of care, our SIP clients will more than likely be in treatment three to five times before they achieve long-term sobriety. Well, for us, that kind of meant, well, maybe it should be, well, they're being sentenced to 180 days for the offense of, of drunk in public. So every client that was coerced care into our program was sentenced to 180 days of, of treatment. Okay, you're sentenced to 180 days. You did 180 days, you relapsed, you came back, you did 180 days, you relapsed, you did 180 days, you relapsed, you achieved long term sobriety. And we we're kind of thinking, well, maybe it's a 180 day times three program, right? Maybe this is a program that, that should last a year and a half rather than six months. Unfortunately, nobody was going to be sentenced to a year and a half in jail for the offense of uh, uh, drunk in public. But the reality is, is that the that the the program probably should be longer than the prescription. Um, nonetheless, that's okay because in our model of care, if there is that relapse, the client is immediately re-engaged back into services, which means that if somebody is court ordered to the program and they failed out of the program, they more than likely were going to be arrested. What John that night for being drunk in public? Yeah, by that day. And then rather than say, okay, that's it. You know, we're going to put you in jail. We're going to do bad things. Horrible things are going to happen to you. We got that client back into services right away. Again, that model of care of no longer cycling through systems, but cycling you back into treatment and supportive services that can help you find long term sobriety. This gentleman here in the upper section, that gentleman there was one of the very first clients enrolled into the treatment program. He had been arrested over a hundred times for drunken public. Each time he was arrested, he was put into sobering services or taken and booked and released four hours, and that was it. Have a nice day. Most police officers knew who he was. Once the serial inebriate program began for the first time in his life, he was held into custody and he was brought into arraignment. He didn't know why he was still in jail and what was happening. And there was a discussion back and forth and the public defender turned to him and said, hey, these people want to tell you that if you, you know, plead guilty, they're going to put you in a treatment program, but you have to do treatment for 180 days, you know, and do you want to plead guilty or do you want to fight this case? And maybe I can get you out of it and who knows what? And he turned to his public defender with tears in his eyes, was crying and said, no one in the hundred times that I've been arrested ever asked me if I wanted help. And to me, that's just such, such sad commentary that we had over a hundred opportunities to intervene in this man's life. And all we did was put band-aids on the problems and treat cancer with aspirin and send him on his way and tell him, look, we're asking you, please don't do this again. The gentleman in the bottom, uh, same situation, same scenario. He had been arrested in every state, but I think Alaska, never made his way to Alaska was offered treatment in lieu of custody time, was enrolled into the serial knee program, graduated the program, and went to be on the Pro-Am golf tour. Apparently was quite a savvy golfer. And the reason why I mentioned that is because our research showed uh, the demographics of the population we served. And so I wanted to spell the myth that we're talking about people that come from a lower so socioeconomic strata. Because the reality is that once we looked at the demographics, we realized that most of our clients had some college education. Um, it's just kind of mindful of the fact that, uh, you know, anybody is eligible. Also, from a law enforcement side, um, I dealt, I, I 
contacted these individuals daily on the street. Um, one of them had been on the street living in an alley for 15 years. Um, I would see him daily pushing the shopping cart. And, you know, we would try to get him into programs. It, it was the criminal justice system, the collaboration that really helped him get off the street. Eventually, the picture on the right is after he'd been in the program a while, he got a job, got an apartment, and he called me up and he, he wanted to meet and go to dinner. So he came to the station, we went outside, we were walking over to my car, we were going to go eat, and he said, hold on a second, let me drive. He had just purchased a new vehicle. So that's a very impactful thing for law enforcement. Somebody that you deal with every single day to see their life change. When in the beginning, prior to SIP, you know, it was this hopeless, no light at the end of the tunnel um, thing that we were dealing with. So, you know, that had a huge impact on many officers who um, really wanted to help people out there get their lives back on track. Uh, one of the things that we did have to address uh, back in 2004 was ultimately was the uh, constitutionality of, of the process itself. And the California Supreme Court did uh, decide that the program was constitutional. That uh, And you can see the comments that were made by a, a court of appeal judge stating that the state had a legitimate need to control public drunkenness when such behavior created a safety hazard, and that the state does not punish the mere condition of being homeless and chronic alcoholic, rather the associated conduct that poses a safety risk to themselves and others. So the People versus Tom, Thomas Kellogg was upheld by the California Supreme Court, and uh, and that was an important milestone for us. So in terms of the success, I mean, you've heard some of the individual examples. Um, it, it was very interesting to see how the community of San Diego came to actually believe in this program. I mean, on the left, there's an article talking about hope. Um, there were a lot of newspaper articles and stories and coverage by the media. But one of the more impactful uh, <laughs> things was when we actually showed that this saved money. And the next slide will uh, depict what that story is about there in the daily transcript. The next study was one that we conducted. And go ahead, please. Uh, the next. Uh, uh, in 2006, we took the first 529 individuals who had been labeled as chronic. And remember, that means 529 people who had been brought to the sobering center five times in 30 days. And we analyzed what happened if they accepted the treatment offer from the judge or if they rejected it. Now, there were also a group of individuals to the right hand side who could not be offered it because they had other charges or things like arson or prior histories of violent behavior. But of the 280 who to whom the treatment was offered, <clears throat> the treatment is accepted by 155 and rejected by 125. And what we did is we compared those two populations from the first offer. We looked um, before and after in equal time periods to find out what happened. <clears throat> Next slide. Now, the way the program began, and this was something from the beginning, was that people were not given 180-day sentences. Um, the, the judges, the Superior Court, wanted to have a progressive sentencing structure so that each time someone came around through the system, having failed on a 30-day offer, the next offer would be 60 days incarceration, followed by 90, 120, 150, and 180. And we looked at the rate of acceptance of individuals to go into the program. And you can see it's almost a, a straight shot of a dose response curve, if you will, of um, the longer and the more iterative the program and the higher the consequences, the more that people were willing to accept the treatment. <clears throat> and, um, and that we found uh, very interesting as to why that is, we really don't know, but it just seemed that San Diego had become kind of a tough love community and people came to understand that they really we're going to see a higher sentence if they didn't take the treatment the next time around. We had some experiential stories from some of our clients who San Diego County is a pretty large county, as we described earlier. But um, what you know within that county, several cities, and so because the serial Nebu program was a project of the city of San Diego, a lot of our clients said, you know what, 
I'm moving to the city next door where they don't have a serial inhibit program because I've come to realize that I can't be drunk in public in the city of San Diego. At one point, we expanded the program to one of the neighboring communities, which might have frustrated frustrated a few people who are intent upon continuing their alcohol use. Um, but we, we moved to that neighboring community and uh, we partnered with them for a couple of years. And um, at one point they were like, you know, we're done partnering with you because they felt that we had solved the problem of drunken public in their community. So we pulled back from that community. Unfortunately, they called back a couple of years later and said they're back. Um, but the, 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 the truth be known though, it became very, pretty well known for those people that were experiencing homelessness, that if you wanted to be a chronic inebriate, you didn't want to do that in the city of San Diego. So what, again, this study was looking at these 529 chronic individuals. These are the ambulance transports that we uh, calculated costs for. These are the number of emergency department visits. These are the number of inpatient days and the total charges amounted to $17.7 million. The next slide shows what happened when we compared those on the left. Um, inpatient emergency department and EMS charges all dropped. You can see by what percentages for those that accepted care versus those who declined the 112 individuals who declined the offer of treatment and their their change in their medical charges per month exploded. What that really meant was that these individuals were just getting ready to get desperately ill or desperately uh, traumatized, a car accident, a fall, or something catastrophic where they were gonna incur an inpatient hospitalization. Uh, this amounted to an enormous amount of dollars saved is all I can say. And you can, and this uh, data became among some of the first in the country that actually was able to demonstrate that this sort of program had both a face to it with individuals who were being um, 15 years on the streets actually being in recovery and successfully changing their lives as well as saving money. Next slide, Denny. So uh, this is a treatment episode data set. Um, thank you, SAMHSA. SAMHSA gathers information from all 50 states regarding their treatment outcomes. You can see the red line 2006 to 2011, what the treatment outcomes were. And um, You'll notice that about 42% of those people who enrolled in treatment completed the treatment program. Fast forward to 2018, and you'll see that that number really hasn't changed, that those people that enter treatment, about 40, now we're at 46%. Um, so on average, you know, 43, 44% of people that enroll in a treatment program will actually complete that program. And so, for myself, I'm not getting any younger. Uh, I've been in working in the field of substance use disorders for 25 years, and it's it's pretty historically known that that that's an accurate number. That about 43% of the people that enroll in your program will complete the program. And the reality beyond that, which is not in this data set, um, is that of those, maybe one in ten will achieve long-term sobriety. So that's just true. Through all of the things that we've done. You're, that's what you're going to see. Now, this is kind of a risky slide for me because, you know, we've been through faith-based models of care, um, the old Synanon programs back in the 70s where they would just, you know, lock you in a room and tell you were a horrible person to stop using drugs, um, through uh, now medical models of care, um, all of these different ideas about how treatment should work. And again, that prescription that, you know, this is the way we're going to do treatment this year, and this is how treatment's going to work, and this is how treatment should be. And the reality is that number just didn't change. For the serial inebriate program, again, we realized that we couldn't keep doing the same thing. We couldn't put chronic alcoholics into programs for people with substance use disorders. In fact, we've written an entire set of curriculum designed to treat the needs of not only chronic inebriates, but chronic inebriates who are experiencing homelessness. It's a very unique population. So um, we had to come up with a whole set of curriculum for that. The program is specifically designed to treat the needs of this demographic. And so you can see for our outcomes, well, we achieved um, we achieved outcomes as high as 80% at, at one point. I do want to explain to you the difference in the bars 
uh, completion rate meant that the client completed the prescribed um, sentence. What that meant, so as Dr. Dunford said earlier, the first time someone was enrolled in the program, it may be that they were only sentenced to a 30 day uh, sentence and they accepted that sentence, enrolled in the program, and completed a 30 day sentence. So that's what you'll see in that red line is completion. That's the number of people who completed treatment. We define the program as a 180 day program. And so we ask people to remain in the program for 180 days. And that's that blue bar that you see that those are the people who completed the entire program. It's interesting to me that you'll see that a lot of people may have had that lower prescription and did that, but a lot of people stayed beyond that. And so we, and we don't know what was the right thing. Was it the 180 days that got the longer term outcomes? Who knows? I still think it should be a year and a half long treatment program. Midway through the program, we partnered with the San Diego Housing Commission. And uh, they are the ones that started providing the transitional housing. The nice thing about that is that the clients can stay in, stay in transitional housing for two years. And so a lot of our clients will complete the treatment program and remain in the housing program for two years. Now, why is this a risky slide? You know, you'll notice that those numbers, those blue numbers are kind of dropping off as you start to get to 2012 and 2015. And so we don't have exact data, but if you're going to ask me experientially why I think that is, is because what a pro what once was a program that was very specifically designed to the needs of the population we served. We started getting feedback and ideas from other people saying, no, this is the way it's got to be. You've got to start doing certain models of care. And so we went from a well defined program into one that started adapting concepts like harm reduction and housing first models of care. That's a really risky thing to say, because that's very experiential. Can I prove that? No, but what I can do is tell you that people that once had a relapse um, in the program, we could elevate them to higher levels of care or to alternate types of care could say, no, I can sit here and I can drink all day. It's a housing first bottle of care and I can stay in this housing as long as I want, which was usually about a week before they walked away. So I know that's tough to hear um, for some people. I am a supporter of housing first models of care. I don't believe that you can treat anybody until they're appropriately housed. But I'm also a supporter of, of, of care that asks the client to participate in their own life and take personal responsibility for their outcomes. And the program is kind of modeled behind that. So I'll take the hits in the chat about that. Um, but you can see that once we took away that very specific program, our outcomes did start to lower. Just to kind of close um, our, our formal presentation, I just want to talk about the fact that the homeless outreach team is, is, is frequently augmented these days by uh, a new population of uh, providers that are called community paramedics, which you may or may not yet have in your community. But these are specially trained paramedics who are dealing with the uh, social determinants of, of individuals' health. And who uh, are not responding to 911 calls, but they're they're responding to the to the incidents and in the and the places where people reside, and doing the back work to try to support the homeless outreach team, the PERT clinicians, and folks like that. And just to demonstrate that these programs have potential, the next slide shows a a study that we did, and this is uh, nine years ago already. Just looking at a handful of of frequent users, the 911 system. And we were able to show that we could reduce again by a couple hundred thousand dollars. This was just one hospital and about a, about 15 clients over a very fairly short period of time. But that things that we know today, which are that the modifiable determinants of people's lives, um, transportation, housing, uh, just the simple things like you're getting your identity and all those things are really important component parts in the use of resources and can help uh, very substantially. So these are promising initiatives that we are uh, we are taking on here in San Diego and believe in wholeheartedly. Uh, perhaps, uh, yeah. I do want to add one more thing. Um, we do talk about the Syrian Libre program as being a course model of care. And the reality is, is that the program was so effective that now probably 75% of the people enrolled in the program today are not court ordered. It went from being a program of coercion to a program of attraction. And most of the people that are enrolled in the program now called us. So it's gotten to the point where people know 
We've had people come here from out of state because they wanted to participate in the program. So um, I think it's important to note that once was you were voluntold, became a program that you are a volunteer. In the, I guess, almost last slide, uh, I, we want to remind everybody that on May 18th, we're going to have a second session. Uh, the Billings Montana police officers are actually coming here to San Diego and are going to be participating with us in uh, the discussion of how they adopted the SIP model to their needs. We're also going to talk more about how the SIP model now in San Diego in partnership with our county behavioral health, city of San Diego attorney uh, and police department and the Callister Institute are expanding the SIP model to address individuals impaired by substances other than alcohol and that in San Diego means 85% of the time methamphetamine. And then uh, explain how sobering services centers can fill gaps in the continuum of care, as we've shown here, uh, those gaps that exist with substance use and behavioral health conditions. Um, the last slide, I believe, is our contact information. Uh, we are all available. We are all more than willing to assist communities however we can. John, what's the fee? Is it a it's a peanut butter sandwich and a pillow. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> we, we no, no chips, no <laughs> chips. Yeah, we're available. Any questions, Any anything we can do to help, we are always willing to provide as much information or whatever you need. And perhaps the last slide is just a list of references of some of the things that we talked about today um, that are, we we feel that there are an awful lot more good references out there. Certainly SAMHSA's website is replete with all, I mean, full of all sorts of uh, uh, workshops and uh, discussions and work groups that have gotten developed among uh, communities. Um, so anyway, we're now officially done with this presentation and ready to take any questions. Oh, wait. So thank you so much to all of our presenters. And um, we have a, a lot of questions that have come in through the chat. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to go through them um, chronologically because I think it aligns with, with how you all went through your presentation. And uh, there are a couple that you've already answered. So uh, we, we may or may not visit those, but we'll get through as many as we can through the end of time. If any of you listening in have additional questions, then feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, I, I will note, if you put them in the chat box, I likely will not see it. So I encourage you to put it in the Q&A box where we can um, see those questions entered. Okay, so uh, just starting off, um, there was someone asking for more detail around um, you know, how do you engage the homeless population in this program? Um, do offices approach first, or do you have a social worker? Um, so, so what does that process look like? So that's a great question. We have, um, like Dr. Dumpert had explained, we have our homeless outreach team, which is a police officer and a per clinician and a health and human service worker, a counselor. We go out as a team and we, we talk to the individuals, uh, get to know them. We get to know what's going on. Uh, we constantly are asking them if they would like help, what that looks like to them. Most of what we've learned, we've learned from the clients. Um, and, and that's what they are. They're clients, they're people we know, they're part of the community. So it's a group, it's a collaboration, it's a partnership. And that's what we found to be the best way to work. And prior to COVID, uh, San Diego PD would do homeless outreach events where they would pair officers with um, substance use disorder counselors in San Diego, mental health clinicians, case managers, and once a month we'd all meet in a certain location and then we'd kind of span out and start working towards engagement with uh, people who are experiencing homelessness. And uh, if we came upon an individual and talked to them and were like, you know, we're here today to offer you help. If they said, I'm willing to go, I want help, let's do it. They were put in the car and driven straight to uh, a program that day. So 
we know experientially that people will take the help when they're willing to take it. And if it's not available in the moment and you come back the next day, they'll likely have changed their mind. So those homeless outreach events that we do are designed to, if we get someone to say yes, we, we move ahead as quickly as possible. That means that we generally have on reserve some of our uh, detox beds. We may have on reserve some residential beds in the communities. Um, sometimes we take somebody to the sobering center um, to a mental health program. Uh, but those homeless outreach events have been very productive. It's also a uh, maybe I don't get you to yes this time, but I'll see you next month. I'm going to talk to you again uh, over and over until we get people um, engaged in services. Thank you for that. And then there was another question, I think just wanting specificity around what is meant by contact to service. So this person asked, do you mean services actually delivered and accepted by the client? Or uh, I, I'll just add, are you meaning contact to first responder services? What, what, what was meant by that? Um, those are other non uh, 911 related calls. They may be visits to clients subsequent to a 911 call or background uh, so that there would be contacts directly with individuals, you know, uh, related to the 911 call itself that could be diverted. But then PERT will oftentimes do uh, follow up calls with individuals too. And so those are also uh, counted as part of contacts. But those, those aren't the ones that are the 911 calls that would result in diversion. Does that help? Yes, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. And then there were a couple of questions that came up when uh, when you were talking about uh, individuals um, that kind of being a cutoff when they are um, using the sobering center for the fifth time. And so uh, you, you mentioned that that number was determined by other substance use professionals and treatment professionals in the community. So do you know what evidence they used in determining that five time threshold? No, it was, well, you, you can imagine that nobody, nobody wanted to be the one that had to make that decision. So it was left to the decision mm -hmm. of, frankly, of the, of the team that were operating the sobering center at the time. Um, law enforcement, healthcare providers were reluctant to make a cutoff. We thought if anybody could do it best, it would be the people who operated the sobering center. And, um, and so it was an arbitrary number. It could have been six, it could have been four, but you can see how rapidly those numbers rose over four years. We had over 500 individuals who qualified for that five visits. And, um, I think to this day, we still feel comfortable with that number in terms of uh, defining who clearly is not having, uh, who clearly is is the system failing? Yeah, that, that number, um, again, I think Jim covered it very well. But prior to the serial inebria program, we had an individual who went to the sobering center 212 times in one year. So, you know, Somebody had to come up with a number and it was not going to be law enforcement or EMS or it was going to be the professionals who interact with this population daily. And the bigger concern too, as, a, as a, you know, as a substance use provider was that uh, there was some concern that, um, and this of course would never happen, but that um, perhaps law enforcement might go out and target an individual and say, well, I'm taking you, I'm taking you, I'm taking you. Um, until you get to that number or, you know, I'm going to ignore this other guy because you made me mad today. So I'm taking you, but not the other guy. And the idea was that if the substance use provider was the determining factor, they acted as Switzerland kind of like, look, everybody that gets arrested comes here and we make that arbitrary number. And, uh, the reality is, like John said, you know, when you're talking about the 1st days of the serial and program. We were treating people who had such a high level of acuity, who had really been um, ignored for so long that their needs were so high um, that that five times that five visits in 30 days was probably five visits in a week. Um, so the, we, we were gathering people pretty quickly who had just um, had a habit of getting drunk in public and spending the night at the sobering center. And so what, what did the process look like when that individual would come in for the fifth time? 
um, then what would what was the process for then routing them down that different path? Yeah, so as I mentioned, when the officer, the officers take every individual to the sobering center. Uh, once they've hit that fifth mark, the officer will then take them into custody and book them into jail. Um, the jail has a process when they see that person coming in as a chronic abuser, uh, that they put them on a, a, a what, I guess a lithium or a uh, no, we, yeah, actually, we I worked for years in the jail. We have a medical uh, clinic. We see all these individuals. The nurses actually begin people on a alcohol withdrawal regimen right from the you know from the front door. They're given vitamins, the usual kinds of things that we would treat people with that are you know traditionally uh, nutritionally deficient. They're they're put on a librium taper that night, and they're seen the next morning by physicians. They then um, are managed on, on a medical part of the unit of the jail. Um, along with other other people, you know, and all their other medical problems get attended to at that time. Um, and then, uh, of course, then there's a there's a they go to court the following, you know, several days later. Usually they've uh, gotten through their first four or five days of withdrawal. They've been on benzos. They feel a lot better. And uh, then they go in front of the judge. And that's when the city attorney will review the case and see if it's a case they're going to issue. And if they do, again, the city attorney is the one that will make that offer of um, getting into the serial inebria program versus going into jail. Uh, and at every point along the way, the client has that opportunity to say, hey, I want help. Once the person's offered uh, the serial inebria program, uh, my team would go into the jail and do a brief uh, clinical assessment on that individual uh, to to our, our goal there was to determine if they were appropriate for the program um, and then also to determine type and level of care. So the serial NEVA program is actually an outpatient treatment program. The clients do not reside on site. They reside in that transitional housing and they come to treatment anywhere from three to five times a week. So um, that level of autonomy is quite a bit of an attraction. And so when I talk to you about the fact that you need to model your program in a specific way. That's a big part of it. People who have traditionally been experiencing homelessness for a very long time are reluctant to enroll in highly structured programs where they're locked in and blackouts for 30 days. Each of our clients has a key to their front door and they come and go as they please as long as they keep their commitment to care. But we go in and we would assess them right away, make sure that they are appropriate for our program. That means that they're not high acuity for mental health. Um, that they do, in fact, meet the criteria for substance use disorder. Um, and so we would report that back to the court. Now, let's say we go in there and they're like, oh, this maybe isn't our guy. This this guy might have uh, be severe, persistent, mentally ill. That doesn't mean it's like, oh, well, too bad for you. Now you're under arrest and you have to stay here. Every client that asks for help under the serial and program would be transitioned into the appropriate type and level of care. So every person that raised their hand and said, yes, Your Honor, I'm guilty of being drunk in public and I would like to enroll in treatment, received treatment. It may not always have been at the traditional serial inebriate program. They may have been moved into a mental health program, but everyone receives care. And one thing that we probably should have mentioned is um, every individual on his way out of the jail and into transitional housing, the housing officer leaning would go over, pick them up and drive them. The first stop they had was their new medical home. So one of our key partners was an outpatient, is an outpatient clinic in San Diego that accepts these uh, these folks. And John essentially gives them the, the talk about the, the emergency room is no longer your medical home. Your medical home is now this clinic. And so they these folks actually reestablish their care in an outpatient clinic setting who actually have an interest in caring for these folks. Thank you for that. that. That's really helpful. And um, you mentioned uh, that you do clinical assessments for folks coming into the program. Does that include a risk assessment or could you describe more specifically what the, the tools are that you use to assess people? So again, it's not your standard. There's no addiction severity index. There's no, we have a tool that we use that's very specific to the population. So we ask questions that are focused on serial inebriates. 
um, now defined as chronic inebriates. By the way, can we just say that we know serial inebriate program, that word serial inebriate maybe is not the most um, tasteful description. Um, just to let everyone know that that phrase came from a judge years ago when we were thinking of what we should call the program. He said, uh, hey, I get it. How about we call it the serial inebriate program, get it, sip? And he thought that was funny. And we're like, yeah, it's not funny. No, and he banged his gavel and he said, no, I like it. Um, we do refer to them as chronic inebriates, and we do refer to them as people experiencing homelessness. Uh, but now, fast forward 20 something years, and we are the serial inebriate program. We do not use standard assessments. We do evaluations for uh, suicide risk and risk analysis, but the screening tools that we use are very specific to the population that we serve. And again, the curriculum that we use is very specific to the population that we serve. I give that curriculum away freely to anybody that wants it. If you contact me, I can try to figure out a way to get it to you. It's, it's quite a volume, so it doesn't always fit through an email, but it's something that we share. Um, but there, you know, yes, do we do suicide risk? Of course we do. Um, but the screening tool that we use is very specific to uh, chronic inebriates. All right, thank you for that. And, and really, uh, thank you so much for acknowledging the, um, the thoughts that you all are having around terminology and, and the, the name of the program and, and how you um, refer to people who are involved in a program. So I appreciate that. Um, so we are at the end of time for questions. And uh, if you do have ongoing questions, please do feel free to reach out. Um, so we shared the contact information at the end of the presentation and those slides will go out in the coming days, so you will have that contact information made available to you. You will also be able to contact the Game Center directly. And if we could just move to the next slide. Uh, so you should see a, a box popping up on your screen shortly where you can download a certificate of uh, attendance. And while we're waiting for that file to pop up, um, we do uh, just another reminder, we'll have another follow up webinar on this program uh, and, and likely some of your questions may be answered during the next webinar um, or, you know, we welcome you to join us and, um, and we share questions you may have, but this will uh, go more into detail around um, how this is being um, implemented in another jurisdiction. And if you see on the file transfer box that popped up on your screen under file name, you, sh you should see a file named CJBH Partnership. Just click on that, it'll, it'll turn a dark gray color, and then you can click the download button, and that will download the um, attendance form directly to your computer. So again, that upcoming webinar, uh, May 18th, if you haven't signed up for the Games Listserv, here is a shortened link. Um, just type this link into your preferred browser and it will take you to a page where you can enter in your email and, and receive correspondence from the Game Center about all upcoming webinars, as well as uh, a monthly newsletter where we often feature programs like SIP and among others across the country. It's also a place where you can learn about SAMHSA publications that are coming out and so forth. So uh, we encourage you to join the listserv if you haven't done so already. And if you're interested in providing input in terms of uh, future work, feel free to participate in the poll that has popped up on the screen. And uh, we will be taking that information into consideration as we develop um, further meetings and technical assistance activities. So uh, thank you so much to our presenters for this tremendously informative information about the SIP program, about the thought that went into creating it and the partnership with the people with lived experience um, in, in shaping the program. Um, so we just really appreciate your time and expertise today. Uh, for any of you interested in obtaining more technical assistance, from the Game Center. Here's our contact information. You can connect with us through the website or through the toll free number. So thank you all again, and we hope to see you on May 18th. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>